for various reasons, people often ask each other, what's your favorite? Oh, you fill in the blank, whatever it might be. This morning, I'm going to ask you to think about what's your favorite animal. Inevitably, if I were to ask each of you, I would get several different animals and for different reasons. If I instead was to ask you, what animal is the king of the jungle? I would expect a large majority to name the same animal, the lion. Lions are viewed as fearless, powerful, and imposing. Their roar alone can be heard up to five miles away. They hunt in packs, so they combine their strength when hunting or killing. We find them to be a popular animal in the Bible, where they are mentioned 84 different verses. For example, Peter compares our greatest enemy to a lion in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But perhaps the most well-known state of, of looking at lions or talking about lions in the Bible comes from one of those stories that we talked about last time that we might classify as a children's story, Daniel and the lion's den. Last month, we talked about David and Goliath to gain lessons beyond what we learned as a child and the lessons we did learn that we need to be reminded of as adults. So I'd like to do the same with this story. Let's set the stage beginning with reviewing who this Daniel was as we start in the book of Daniel, chapter one, verses one through seven. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure home of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to whom the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Peltejazar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. Due to God's sins, God sent Nebuchadnezzar, Due to Israel's sins, rather, God sent Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon to conquer Jerusalem and to take captives. In addition to taking articles from the temple, the king directed the taking of some of the young men from the lineage of Israel's king and other nobles. They had to be without blemish, good looking, gifted in wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to serve. Over three years, these were to be taught the knowledge and skills necessary to truly serve the king. Only four are named by Moses, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or otherwise known by their Babylonian names, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know that Daniel with his three friends negotiated to get vegetables versus the rich diet of the king's table that was prescribed. He got that consideration because of the relationship created with the chief of the eunuchs by God in Daniel 1.9. Now, God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. It was God's action. These four friends proved that what God wanted them to eat was better for them. And thus, all the young men were given that same diet. As three years passed, God continued to bless these four young Israelites, as recorded in Daniel 1, verse 17 through 20. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them. And among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. 
And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. You may recall another story of Daniel that followed this evaluation. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream he wanted to have interpreted. Now, he knew that his wise men often made up interpretations. All right, lied. So he demanded that they not only be able to interpret his dream, but also to tell him what the dream was that they would interpret. The, strong, the response of the Chaldeans, Babylonian astrologers, magicians, wise men, set the stage for God and Daniel when they answered the king in Daniel chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. They spoke accurately. No man could provide that information. Only God, not gods, could provide what Nebuchadnezzar sought. Well, this made the king so angry that he commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be killed. Since Daniel and his friends fell into that category, they were included in the list, though they were unaware of what had triggered the king's anger. Rather than quaking in fear, Daniel acted with wisdom and asked the captain of the king's guard, why is this, there this urgent decree? And once he understood, he asked the king to give him some time to satisfy his demands. He again didn't place his confidence in himself as he informed his three friends so that they all could ask for God's mercy in revealing what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know. And God in turn blessed him by giving him the secrets, the dream and the interpretation in a night vision. And Daniel returned to the king who asked Daniel if he can now tell him what he wants to know. And Daniel's answer again shows his humility and faithfulness in Daniel chapter 2 verses 28, 7 and 28. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot deliver to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. At which point, Daniel proceeds to describe the dream and provide its interpretation. And as a result, the king honors both Daniel and his God, with Daniel seeking blessings for his three friends who had prayed to God for him, with him for the secrets, as we read there in Daniel chapter 2, verses 47 through 49. The king answered Daniel and said, truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. In Daniel chapter 4, what appears to be an edict from Nebuchadnezzar is recorded noting another instance in which he had a dream he could not interpret nor could his magicians or wise men. He turns to Daniel and explains his dream while looking for Daniel through his God to interpret it. But Daniel's hesitant to respond and had to be encouraged to provide the interpretation. Daniel explains that the king will be driven from men and act like animal, eating grass for seven years because of his pride and his belief that he is above gods. But that when he recognized God as the everlasting, he would regain his senses and return to his kingdom. As a result, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges God's supremacy. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those walk in pride he is able to put down. He spoke from experience. He spoke from what he knew. Nebuchadnezzar's son came into power upon his death, but he suffered from the same human frailty of pride. He requested that the vessels that his father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem be used to drink wine while they praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. 
That same evening, fingers of a hand appeared and wrote on the palace wall. He called for the same men who had failed his father to gain interpretation. Once again, they were unable to provide it. And the king was not only frightened, but greatly troubled. As is often the case, his wife came to his rescue by remembering what Daniel had done with Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, his father's. Therefore, Daniel is sent for, and he's promised a gold chain along with the role of third in the kingdom if he can provide the interpretation. Daniel turns down the rewards, but does provide the interpretation. Daniel tells the king he has not been humble and has offended God through his actions. And as a result, his kingdom has been determined to end. Even with such a negative interpretation, the king recognizes that this is what it means. And he gives Daniel the promised reward that he had earlier turned down. That night, the king is slain. And the kingdom is turned over to Darius the Mede. In Daniel, we have a man proven to be faithful to his God. And whose God has proven to be faithful to him. We have numerous major events that document that relationship as well as God's preeminence over those who might be in power. But yet we find those people in power consistently forgetting the lesson that they've been taught. That extensive background brings us to the key story we're examining today, found in Daniel chapter 6, starting in verses 1 through 3. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. The new king sets up the administrative structure of his kingdom, establishing 120 satraps or local leaders that would report to three governors, including the man the previous king had just promoted, Daniel. Once again, Daniel shined in the role he'd been given to the point that King Darius was considering putting him above the other two governors. The idea that this, this Judean could rise to that level did not please everyone, as we read in the next two verses, in verses four and five. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. There's no surprise that jealousy has raised its ugly head in those that felt that they need only to report to the king and not to this upstart. They needed to discredit, needed to discredit Dan, Daniel, but they could not find anything to fault him for. Nothing that could result in his downfall. Sounds kind of similar to someone in the New Testament. That, of course, drives them to come up with plan B. But unlike with Jesus, these men don't turn to the route of employing false witnesses. They determine that they will try to turn Daniel's strength, his faith, against him. They know he would not go against the commandments of God, so they must find a way to make that obedience be viewed as wrong by the king. So we turn to verses six through nine. So these governors and satraps throng before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except for you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. These are cunning men who not only hope to use Daniel's faith against him, but also use the king's vanity as well. When requesting a royal decree, they claim to represent all the leaders. But we know that at least Daniel was not a part of what they were asking. In appealing to Darius's vanity, they propose that for 30 days, no one can petition, ask of anyone or anything except the king. Anyone who fails to act accordingly should be cast into the den of lions. 
They have identified something that they know Daniel will not do. And they have found the most permanent way to get him out of their chain of command, death. On the surface, it sounds good to the king that everyone would yield to his position. And if they dare not do so, then they should be subject to a dramatic, painful death. These schemers are not done yet, though. They know the favor that Daniel's established with the king and the kings that preceded him. They need to be sure that Daniel is permanently removed as a thorn in their side. So they appeal to the king's signs of decree so that it cannot be changed. Because once that's done, their laws did not allow for it to be changed. What should have been a warning sign to Darius is ignored. And he acts just as they requested. So now it's time to see how Daniel reacts in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. What was Daniel's response to the new law? Did he change his behavior? Did he continue but try to do it covertly, secretly? No. He went straight home and with his windows wide open, he proceeded to do just as he had always done three times that day. He knelt and prayed to God. Was it a prayer requesting protection? Was it one that called for retribution on those working to bring him harm? We're not told anything like that. What we are told is that he gave thanks before his God. Even facing the likelihood of the den of lions and still finding himself in captivity, he found reasons to thank his God. Is that always our reaction when faced with pending threats and difficult situations? There is nothing wrong in asking God to come to our rescue. David, a man after God's own heart, turned to God frequently in his many times of trouble and wrote of doing so in Psalms. In Psalms 50:15, one of the temple musicians, Asaph, summarizes what David had leaned on so many times. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Right before that, in the previous verse, Asaph writes, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. There is always much to thank God for, no matter the situation that we may face. At the very least, we should be thankful for the ability to speak to God. But greater than the fact that we can speak to him is the reality that he will act. Will he always act as we request? No. He will act in our best long-term interests. Daniel may well have prayed to God about the expectation of being sentenced to the den of lions, but he did not make that the sole substance of his prayer. Too many times when we face difficulties, that's all we pray about. And worse yet, too many times we pray very rarely other than when we do face troubles. David had established a prayer life that even his enemies knew could be counted on. And God knew that David valued his ability to speak with him. Let's continue on with the next three verses, verses 11 through 13. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who was one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Like clockwork, Daniel's enemies found him praying openly and routinely. Notice here that it is said that he was making supplication or petitioning God. So it could well be that he was asking for God's intervention in what he knew was about to happen or to give him strength through it. But had Daniel's life set an example for others? Absolutely. They knew he was faithful to his God. Their actions were not particularly directed at God, but rather to take advantage of Daniel's commitment to God. Our example 
may not always be seen as positively by those who observe us, but it will be noted. Whether it convicts someone to investigate what lies beyond, behind our faith or to dismiss it is not our concern. It is our concern, it is our responsibility to set the example. We are called on to plant the seed and to water it, but it is up to God to bring the increase. Note that Daniel was not like the hypocrites that Jesus spoke against in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, who prayed to be seen by men. Daniel was not hiding, but he was not doing it to build himself up either. It is at this point that Daniel's enemies reveal the trick they had pulled on the king. They had not been interested in promoting King Darius. They had lied about who all had been a part of defining the royal decree. Perhaps he should have smelled a rat when they emphasized that it could not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians. Why was that so important? It was because they knew that the king valued Daniel and would not want to carry through with this decree. It is why they emphasized what the law said, even though there could be very little doubt that King Darius remembered something he had decreed so recently that it stroked his ego. They established the unchanging nature of the law before revealing who they have found violating it. They make their case that this was not a singular act by Daniel, but something that he did three times a day. It shows, though, that this was not a happenstance observance of Daniel praying, but that it was a result of continuous spying on him. What's the king's reaction to being made aware that he had been the pawn of a personal plan to get satisfaction against the enemy of these men? Well, let's read on in verses 14 through 17. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute with the king established may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Just as Daniel's enemies had expected, the king was angry with himself for having been tricked and for it potentially costing him a tremendously useful aid. He spent the rest of the day focused on trying to find a loophole, a way to get around his decree. But Daniel's enemies, had set a solid trap. At sundown, the men returned to the king and again emphasized that he has no choice but to carry out his statute's punishment. Undoubtedly, with a heavy heart, the king sends men to bring Daniel and to put him in the lion's den. We then find a powerful declaration of faith. The Bible has lots of powerful declarations of faith, so it makes this one so interesting. It doesn't come from Daniel who has clearly got a strong faith. It comes from the king. He's trying to comfort and strengthen Daniel by saying, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Notice he didn't say, hopefully he will deliver you, or maybe he'll deliver you. The king said he will deliver you. Earlier, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, started their response to the king's demand that they worship his idol, or be placed in the fiery servants, furnace by saying God will deliver them, but said they would not serve gods even if he did not deliver them. Was the king that confident? No if. If he had been, would he have spent the day trying to find a way out of the decree? Was he just trying to encourage Daniel? We can't say for certain. But given what Daniel and his three friends, by God, had been able to do for those who had ruled before King Darius, he had a reason to believe that at least it was a possible outcome. He follows up his declaration by sealing the lion's den. And the story continues in the next verses from 18 to 23. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, 
Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, so they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. We see that whether the king believed in what he had told Daniel or not, he spends a restless night focused on Daniel. He fasted. He did not seek any type of entertainment. He could not sleep. He was willing to follow the letter of the law he had established, but notice that he wasted no time in getting to the lion's den to see if what he declared had come to pass or if Daniel was maimed or devoured. He did not wait to physically see if Daniel was alive. Perhaps he did not want to see the scene if God had not delivered him. So instead he calls out to Daniel, but not just to see if he somehow lived through the night. He asked Daniel if Daniel's God has been able to deliver him. More interestingly, he mentions the dedicated life that Daniel has lived in respect to God. A life he's been able to, to preserve, to see. And he says, your God whom you serve continually. What a tremendous thing for someone to say about you. His life had not gone unnoticed, even from the person in the highest of power. The re reality is that however you're living your life, it is noticed by others, even if you don't think so. Daniel's response starts with showing respect to the king. Daniel holds no grudge against Darius for the law and the predicament he's just gone through. Daniel knows whose idea it was and understands that Darius has been tricked. He also immediately attributes his survival to the miraculous intervention of God through his messenger who had closed the mouth of the lions. He also makes it clear that he was deemed worthy of that intervention because he was found innocent of sinning against God. He didn't follow the edict. Instead, he followed God. He also states that he'd done no wrong against the king. It may be that Daniel did not actually petition God when he prayed, but merely thanked God. But as was stated earlier in this chapter, he was giving him just thanks. It may be just that his enemies assumed he was petitioning as he normally did. But personally, I think he had been praying just as he always had done it. But Daniel's point was that such an act was not a wrong against the king. The edict was wrong, not his decision to execute it. I have no doubt that we're nearing a time where Christians are again going to find themselves facing situations like that of Daniel. No, I do not think we'll see a decree where we can only petition the president or even the government. I do think We'll be faced with making decisions about doing what God directs or what a law states. We will be told that things have changed with the culture from when God stated what he accepted and what therefore we should now accept. We see sins like homosexuality becoming accepted by the government as well as other religious organizations. But if culture was enough to define whether such a lifestyle was accepted, then Sodom and Gomorrah would still be standing. Moses wrote in Genesis 19, verses 4 and 5, Now before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them carnally. This was not a request from a few of the men, several of them, or even a small majority. All the men from every quarter make the request of Lot. Culture does not change God's mind or his laws. The role of women in the church is not based on the culture of the day. Jesus engaged several women in different ways in his ministry, but they were never put in a position of authority over men. Paul told the young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, and I do not permit a woman to teach to, or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. He follows that up explaining the reason. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. He didn't say that's because that's what the culture that we see today is that women shouldn't have authority to be silent. It was in the order of creation and the order of sinning if we carried on to the next verse. 
Does that make women less in the kingdom? Of course not. It just ascribes to them a different role. Is that role to be based on culture and therefore open to being changed as a culture's view of women changes? No. God's law is not implemented on what man thinks is acceptable. So today, we're chastised for our commitment to God's laws. In the future, we may find that we are violating man's laws. But we, like Daniel, can say, I have done no wrong before you. Like Daniel, though, that will not prevent us from being mistreated. Will we be as faithful and trust in God? The king is very happy here to find Daniel still alive and orders him brought out of the lion's den. Not only is Daniel alive, but he's totally unharmed by his ordeal. The credit for that outcome is totally attributed to his belief in God. And therefore, God had acted in response to Daniel's unwavering faith. What happens next is shared in the next verse, verse 24. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, they, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. While it turned out well for Daniel, the deceit and evil that had been sought called for its own punishment. The sin wasn't just against Daniel, nor did it just include the king, but it had been a sin against God. Darius acted quickly against those who had schemed yet failed. These men were sought and given the same punishment. Not only them, but their wives and children were also thrown in the lion's den. The angel is no longer there to shut the lion's mouths, who clearly were hungry as they proceeded to overpower the people to the point of breaking all their bones before they can even have their bodies reach the bottom of the den. God had his own hand in meeting out the judgment and punishment and proving that the delivery was not because the lions were not hungry. Darius learned a lesson from this episode, which he wished to share as documented in verses 25 through 27. Then King Darius wrote, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Whether Darius spoke from faith in God delivering Daniel prior to the event or not, he speaks boldly of God following it. He is a living God who does not waver with the kingdom which will endure. He is a God of action and a God that rescues those who are committed followers. Each time God shows his power and his faithfulness, man is driven to acknowledge the obvious. Staying faithful to our words is a real proof of commitment. The chapter wraps up with what happened to the one who remained faithful to God in verse 28. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Daniel prospered not only during the rest of King Darius's reign, but into that of his successor, Cyrus the Persian. God not only rescued him from the lions, but he continued with Daniel throughout his life. God has also promised to always be with us if we remain faithful. Jesus states in what we call the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 20, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So what do we learn from the children's story of Daniel in the lion's den? As children, we learn that Daniel was faithful to God, and God was faithful to him, which calls us to do the same and expect God to be faithful to us. Whether we learned it as children or not, we also learned about the impact of Daniel's example. He did not live his life to impress his peers or even the king, but it left an impression nonetheless with both. We are called to do likewise. As Jesus told those gathered for the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 or 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Daniel was not just praised by the kings for what he did, but God was given the glory through Daniel's actions and his ascribing the outcomes to God. 
may we do the same with our lives. Let us not waver for what we know God expects of us, no matter what the outcome may be. In today's cancel culture, we may lose friends, we may lose jobs, and in the end, we may end up losing our freedom. But we should know less than Daniel, with no less faith, that God will bring us about good. Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 8, verses 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Doing God's will will result in blessings like Daniel received from the positions and rewards the kings gave him. But when doing his will does not seem to bring those results, we know that the ultimate result of heaven will still be ours, making whatever we suffer in this life to be of no account. Today, do we find you being a Daniel, faithful to God, or do we find you even with a relationship with God? If you have yet to become a, tri- a Christian, then don't put it off any longer. Act on your belief by repenting of your sins, talking to one of the elders or deacons to arrange to confess your belief in God's son and be baptized. If you have become less than completely faithful to where others do not see God in all your actions, then repent and regain that faithful example. Seek out the elders and your fellow Christians to help and encourage you in reestablishing yourself as a modern Daniel. If you are faithful, then commit to keeping it going no matter what the world may throw at you. Whatever your plan of action may be, let us all join together in song.